Um, in today's simulation industry, almost every one of us encounter the situation of doing a non-linear analysis, irrespective of the experience level. So we, we thought of uh, doing a short webinar on um, uh, how to do um, geometric non-linear analysis, uh, emphasizing the importance of doing the non-linear analysis, more importantly, when and how to do non-linear analysis and um, highlighting how to do it right without complicating the numericals involved in doing the nonlinear analysis. So when I prepared this presentation, I kept uh, the course objective as giving you uh, understanding about nonlinear analysis in users or application point of view, rather going deep into the basics of nonlinear finite element analysis itself. Um, well, I thought of uh, not using any equations, uh, but the, during our schooling, the mathematics are unavoidable unavoidable science. Then we chose engineering as our profession. Uh, the equations, we are married to the equation. It's, it's unavoidable. We cannot escape with that. So there are um, equations which are basically um, solid mechanics equations or finite element uh, introduction equation. I hope um, you know, everybody can understand and follow it. The, the course flow will be, will be starting with the motivation, emphasizing the importance of uh, doing geometric nonlinear analysis or in other words, um, if we ignore the uh, geometric nonlinear effect, um, know how uh, disastrous our results are going to be. Then we will be starting with uh, you know, differentiating um, small and uh, large deflection problems. Then moving on, we will be classifying uh, geometric nonlinear problems into various categories. And also we will be introducing different um, stress and strain measures commonly used in nonlinear analysis. And it really becomes important to understand uh, the kinematics and constitutive relation when we are uh, dealing with a nonlinear analysis. Um, however, without using a lot of equation, I try to keep as simple as possible to give you a feel of uh, what is this kinematic and constitutive relations are. And the, the solution pro, uh, procedure or the solution algorithm for any nonlinear problem is quite different from uh, any linear static problem and moreover we have too many parameters to play with to converge any uh, nonlinear solution. So we'll be introducing um, you to the uh, nonlinear solution procedure and uh, different convergence um, norms. And towards the end we'll be giving um, certain uh, consideration for uh, meshing when we are planning for any nonlinear analysis and uh, doing the result interpretation. Let us, let us start with a um, you know, very simple problem to understand how important uh, yeah, non -linear, geometric nonlinear analysis. Um, I have taken a, a square plate of uh, uh, 1mm in, uh, in size for every side and it's fixed at all the ends. It's made up of a steel and it's 3mm thickness. It is subjected to a, a lateral pressure of uh, 0.1 MPa. Uh, when we solve this problem using a simple linear static analysis, um, no, we are going to get deflection around uh, 783 mm. But uh, imagine a situation, a yeah, 1 meter, a uh, 3 mm thick steel plate of 1 meter in size deflecting 782 mm is uh, something unobvious. It is practically not possible. And uh, if you look at how the structure is taking the applied pressure, it is taking in a bending mode. So the most of the reactions are in the bending or lateral direction. But this is a thin plate structure. When we design a thin plate structure, we design it to carry the applied load in the membrane uh, stress state rather than taking it as a bending stress state. When we activate a uh, geometric nonlinear calculation, and this is going to give you a, a lateral deflection around 16 mm. So it makes that a 3 mm thick steel plate of 1 meter in size deflecting 16 mm makes sense. We could feel that, okay, this looks something realistic rather getting the deflection around 283 mm um, 
which is unrealistic so the the results what you are going to see in the software could be largely different depending on whether you are doing a nonlinear analysis or you are not considering the nonlinear effect let's start thinking about um, no how it is implemented most of the time um, the finite element method as a tool or any finite element package uh, including ansys is not a magic box what we are trying to do is we are trying to reproduce the same classical mechanic um, governing equations in a different form in a matrix form and we are trying to solve them numerically uh, the same equation is solved using a differential equation in classical mechanics let us start with a simple problem to understand uh, no where uh, in our basic classical mechanics where we are um, missing the nonlinear effect and how to account the nonlinear effect even in our classical formulation let us take a, a two uh, rod link mechanism as shown in the picture uh, our interest is to find the deflection under given force yes uh, so we when we generally start solving this using analytical method we start with drawing a free body diagram and and writing the equilibrium of forces so uh, i could write the two members are going to take the equal amount of force and i, I can write the force in each member as a applied force divided by two times the cos of uh, the angle between those two in order to find the deflection under this force uh, what we can do is we can calculate the um, no the work done uh, internal work done and the external work done then we can equate them together to find the deflection the external work done is nothing but the area under force displacement curve that's nothing but of um, force into the deflection and the internal work done on one particular bar can be extracted from the stress strain relation assuming so based on hooke's law under linear um, limit so we could uh, write internal work done as the integral of stress into strain over the volume i think it for a whole structure we need to there are two uh, rods so we need to account two of them and the the force on each member can be taken from the uh, equilibrium equation equating the external work and internal work we could get the deflection as a function of applied force and as a function of initial uh, geometry l and alpha and so on if you want to do the same uh, calculation using a finite element method we start with writing a stiffness matrix of a truss element um, assuming uh, assuming it's like it's going to deform only in the axial direction and we get a truss finite element matrix then uh, for the whole problem we are going to write the element stiffness matrix for element 1 and element 2 then we are going to assemble them together for global stiffness matrix this is the final fm equation what we are going to get there are two equations and two unknowns u2 and v2 uh, v is the horizontal displacement that's obviously going to be zero u2 can be found this is same that of uh, the expression that we have found in um, our classical formulation or analytical method let us look at how things are going wrong uh, with a numerical example this is a 1 meter rod this rod is of a diameter of 1 mm you can imagine a, a typical steel rod used in the concrete it it's it's that um, thick and 1 meter length it is subjected to a 5 kg of load if we substitute these numbers in this expression um, we are going to get a deflection of 1.56 meters okay so it's again evident that a 1 meter steel rod of 1 cm diam deflecting 1.56 it's it's more than no um, one and a half 150 times it's being stretched it is, it is practically not possible something obviously going wrong with the approach that we have followed so far let us try to understand um, where we where we have um, done the mistake and what makes the results to be unrealistic it looks you know we we have followed every basic um, in a right way but still the results are not realistic let us start figuring out uh, where things are going wrong first one it's a it's a classical example to understand the geometric nonlinearity as i load my structure as this um, as the as the rod uh, gets stretched the angle alpha is going to change even for the small uh, change in the displacement the alpha is going to change 
But however, we have uh, written the equilibrium equation based on the initial angle between these two stresses. We are not accounting how this angle is going to change as the deformation takes place. Second one we have considered is, we have written the expression for the work done um, assuming um, the, the displacement is only the function of force. We have not considered the angle alpha uh, in order to calculate the deflection. These are all the two places um, where uh, we are missing the, uh, no, the, the physics. The things we have done with, the things which went wrong with the FEM uh, formulation, Again, the transfer matrix where we want to calculate um, the coefficients cos alpha and sin alpha, we have calculated it again based on the initial configuration. We have not accounted the changes that are happening in the geometry. And the second mistake uh, thing, or another saying a mistake, the second important information we have not considered in the finite element formulation is we assume that. We assume that whenever a rod deforms along its axis, only along the axis, it is producing the strain. But however, if we consider a situation like this, there is no deformation in the horizontal direction. However, because of the rotation, the rod gets stretched. We assume that this stretch is not causing the strain. This is the again um, important thing that we are missing in our linear finite element formulation. Um, so the basically what we have done is we have assumed that deflection or the change in geometry is very small compared to the initial dimension of the geometry. That, the, assuming this we have done all these calculations. Now let us think about how to do it right. If I want to predict the result which is realistic, how to do it? So I have to account the change in length that is happening on this rod element. Then if we start writing my force equilibrium equation and equating the external and internal work, I would get my equations going to be right. Here is an example. Look at the final expression for the deflection here. In this expression, I am going to use my deformed geometry that is L task as one of the parameters. So my final end deflection U depends on the deformed configuration of this thing. Now, the force, displacement, and change in geometry. All these parameters are coming into a single equation. So, there is, we cannot solve this equation um, in, a, in a unique manner. We have to solve this using an iterative technique. So, for example, we, uh, we solve this using an incremental manner. If you look at the same expression in a linear solution, this deflection has no relation with deformed configuration, but however here, the deflection has relation with the deformed configuration. So if I want to solve the same problem under 5 kg or 50 Newton load, I have to apply the load in an incremental manner and solve that to predict the nonlinear response of the structure under given loading condition. Uh, start moving on, uh, discussing something about um, uh, what is nonlinearity? Let us say if you want to describe a nonlinearity, um, the nonlinearity is the term not only specific to FEM, it's almost used in uh, all engineering fields. In order to describe a nonlinear system or nonlinear analysis, let us say we have a structure or a system. Generally, we describe uh, the system in a mathematical sense using its stiffness matrix, mass matrix, damping matrix, and so on. So we are applying uh, different loads onto the structure. We can say those are the inputs to my system. The different inputs could be we could apply a pressure, force, temperature, enforced displacement, and things, so on. What we are interested is, we are looking for the output or response of the structure, such as deflection, stresses, strains, and these are all the things we are um, interested in, and that's how the system responds. Now, when we start relating the input and output, if the relation between these two is linear, then we say this is a linear system. Say for example, if I apply 10 kg load and the deflection is 1 mm, then if I increase the load by 10 kg again, now my total load becomes 20 kg and the deflection is 2 mm. Another one uh, 10 kg increment, so the total load is 30 kg and the deflection is um, 3 mm. Now, the relation is linear. What it means is, 
for every 10 kg of load increment the deflection increases by 1 kg there is a linear relationship between these two for whatever reason if the relationship breaks say for example under 30 kg load instead of deflection being a 3 mm if the deflection becomes say something like 2.8 mm or 3.5 mm then we break the linearity this kind of behavior is called as a nonlinear behavior a system which exhibits this behavior is called as a nonlinear system in structural analysis if the relation between the input and output you could take any term as your input and any term as your output if the relationship is not linear something like this or like this then we say the system is nonlinear system in order to predict this response we have to do a nonlinear analysis let us say how a response is going to be different from a linear system so for example let us assume a spring is subjected to a force when this system is linear the blue the middle black color line is a linear response of the system we are getting displacement somewhere here depending on the characteristic of the structures loading pattern and the boundary condition the system can exhibit a stiffen behavior or soften behavior here is a, a behavior when the system behaves in a hardened way or stiffen way the, under the same load the deflection could be large when the system exhibits a soften behavior really what is happening in the sense Uh, this is the basic equation that we are going to use throughout our FEM. Force is equal to the stiffness and the displacement. Under the same force, if the displacement is varying, the only possible reason is the K is varying. Okay, that's the only possible reason that can cause a system to deviate from the linear behavior. So the whole nonlinearity revolves around what makes the stiffness matrix to change so if you find the answer for that um, we, we we are clear with uh, nonlinearity let us i'll just show you a couple of examples on a system or a structure which is behaving in a stiffen way then there some practical example wherein the systems behaving under a soften way here is an example of a, a, a long cantilever beam subjected to a tip load as you could as you could see here this is the supposed to be a linear response of the structure if it is linear under given load the displacement is going to be here around 900 mm since the system exhibits a uh, hardening behavior or stiffen behavior under the same 100 newton load we are going to see a less deformation so now this this particular structure under given loading condition behaves under behaves as a a uh, hardened manner or as a it exhibits a stiffening behavior let us look at another example for um, you no know, softening behavior of a structure it's a column subjected to a um, um, axial force typically it's a buckling response of a column what it happened the sense it start exhibiting a softening behavior say uh, beyond a limit my force increment is only a small amount but this small force increment causes a large increment in the displacement what it means in the sense the system start behaving in a softened uh, way here are the examples for the um, system exhibiting softening and hardening behavior um let us think what most of the people understand about uh, geometric nonlinearity the moment we say geometric nonlinearity what comes to uh, most of the engineers mind is okay geometric nonlinearity has something to do with a large deflection whenever you expect a large deflection uh, we have to account the, the geometric nonlinearity but that's not true often times um, the large deflection analysis or geometric nonlinearity makes your displacement less let us revisit the first example what we have um, discussed the same plate of 1 meter length when we do a linear analysis it predicts a large displacement of 782 mm which is practically not possible but the moment we consider the geometric nonlinearity it shows the maximum displacement of 15 mm which is realistic but remember that here is a tip often times when we account the geometric nonlinear effect in our analysis the resulting deformation is going to be most of the time but not always 
lesser than the results which are predicted by the linear analysis but though it is less that is what realistic it is so we have to account the geometric nonlinearity so as a fc analyst why should we worry about uh, non geometric nonlinearity as most of us know the first output we are going to get from any uh, finite diamond calculation is displacement if our displacement is not realistic or not close to the actual solution further all derived quantities something like stresses strain everything is going to be wrong so we need to make sure you know the deflection that we are predicting is uh, more realistic and comparable with that of a real time behavior often times when we do a, a analysis whether linear or non linear analysis it is not always easy to decide whether the numbers what we got from the software is good or bad um, especially um, uh, you know if we do not have any reference result uh, from experimental data or from the closed form analytical solution but however if we have a um, um, Uh, experimental data it is uh, it is easy for the analyst to say okay how accurate your results are or how realistic your results are but most of the situation that we end up with we do not have a reference solution either we are going for a um, you no know, new design or we are trying to modify our existing design with um, certain innovative ideas for that we do not have any reference results under such a situation in order to gain the confidence okay whatever the results that i'm going to um, produce is um, realistic and it is um, you no know, uh, reasonably accurate in order to make the decision uh, we need to have um, certain knowledge about the basic finite element method if not be and we need to in addition we should have a fundamental knowledge about the software that we are using to able to judge appropriateness of the chosen element and chosen sol solution algorithm and so on let us start uh, looking at some of the terminologies which is specific to uh, non linear analysis so from numerical point of view structural behavior is divided into two categories one we say a small deformation analysis and another one we call it a finite deformation analysis when we say small or large there is no clear line between when we can say this is a small deformation when we can say this is a large deformation everything is with respect to the initial dimension of the geometry for example uh, shown here the rod is subjected to axial force if you are seeing a deflection which is very small but compared to okay you know the point is compared to the initial dimension of the geometry then we can say that as a small or negligible or infinitely small displacement problem if the deformation is large then we have to account this the deformation that are happening in the structure while formulating its stiffness matrix then we can say this is a large deformation or finite deformation when we are dealing with a large or finite deformation or finite strain problem we have to use a different stress strain measures than uh, the ones that we use for a small deformation analysis uh when the when the structure is undergoing a large strain what would happen we see a drastic change happening in the area which really takes the load uh initially when we start with okay there is some amount of making happen the amount of area which really takes the load is keep reducing so in order to account this we have to use a uh, true stress and true strain measure um uh, in doing the calculation or to interpreting the result so often times um, the material test data or the stress strain curve that we get from our laboratory are reported in engineering stress strain format we need to convert them as a true stress strain format to either feed into the software to interpret the result after doing a geometric nonlinear analysis let us start um, uh, classifying the geometric nonlinear problem often times it becomes confusing to classify the problem based on the displacement rather 
if you could think in terms of the strain, uh, because the strain normalizes with the initial dimension of the structure, then it gives clear indication whether what we are going to deal with a small strain problem or large strain problem. And large, large displacement uh, not necessarily should lead to a large strain. For example, here is an example, here is a rod which is just rigidly rotated. But here is a large rotation happening, but there is no strain happen in the structure at all. It is rigidly rotated. But another case is here. Here, the deformation is small compared to a rigid rotation, but still the amount of strain is large. So it becomes important to understand whether the problem that we have in hand is a large strain problem or large displacement or rotation, but still it's a small strain problem. Let us start looking into um, some of the examples to distinguish what is large deflection, what is large rotation, what is finite strain or large strain, so on. Then towards the end, we would um, try to address what is uh, stress stiffening and spin softening of the structural behavior. Let us first start with a large deflection. Um, here is the example. Uh, in this category, the structure experiences the large deflection because of its orientation, not because of the stretch or shape change of the element. The examples are typically what we can see in a large shell structure or snap through buckling of arches or a buckling is a typical, a linear buckling is a typical example for a large deflection problem, a fishing rod and other thing. Here is an example, this is around 2.5 meter rod, it is subjected to um, 100 newton force. The amount of deflection is really large, it is undergoing around 1000 mm deflection, but the strain is still less than the 1 percentage strain. This is an example for a large deflection, but still a small strain problem, not a finite strain problem. Let us look at a large rotation problem. Here, we assume the rotations are large, even the displacement is less, and the strain is, either there is no strain, or it could be a small strain problem. The typical example is available in a verification manual 40, a rigid rotation of a round. What would happen if deformed by a large amount, still there is no rotation. And let us look at some tips and tricks when handling a large rotation problem. Uh, there is a fundamental difference between how we create a rigid connection between the two flexible finite elements. Generally, we could do it using either MPC elements or using a CE rig. Here is an example I wanted to demonstrate. Uh, there are two beam elements which is connected to a, connected through a, a MPC 184 element. Here, I have applied an enforcement of 90 degree rotation. So when we solve this problem using a geometric nonlinear analysis, we are going to see a result like this, which is this is what we are expecting. Okay? The same problem is solved using a C ring. Here, instead of using a MPC element, I am going to use a C ring. What it happens, we are not seeing the results as expected. Okay? This is not coming straight as we have seen in our previous slide. What what it means in the sense the C rig, which, which is nothing but a, a linear relation between the degrees of freedom between the two nodes. Especially when we are talking about a large rotation problem, the coefficients of constant equations are not get updated as structure deform. So you should be very careful when if you want to use C rig in large rotation problem, but however, C rigs can take care of large strain problem. Also, you can use to create a bonded contact between two rigid um, surfaces and so on. So think about it. If, if, if you have a problem which undergoes a large rotation, um, we don't recommend using C rigs. Instead, we recommend using MPC 184 elements. Let us look at uh, large strain or finer strain problem. Uh, when we, this is the most dominant category wherein your structure can really deform its shape to a large extent, okay? Such that we cannot ignore the shape changes that is happening. In this category, the deflection and rotation can be really large. It's not necessarily to be a small. Oftentimes, when the structure undergoes a large strain, there is a considerable amount of um, 
change that is happening in the dimension of the structure and shape of the structure. So when we formulate the stiffness matrix in an incremental way, we account for the changes that is happening in the shape. Um, when again when the structure undergoes a large strain, typically we um, get into a material nonlinearity as well. Either we go into a plasticity or if we take a, a, a components like rubbers, we will get into a high elasticity um, so on. Here is an example of a large deflection. Um, yeah, this particular rubber boot deforms by 23 mm and it experiences one twenty percentage of the strain, which is really high. Okay. Okay, so having discussed about um, large or finite strain, large displacement, let us look at what is stress stiffening or spin softening. Here is an example. Um, this stress stiffening is applicable only to a membrane like structures, wherein, if we apply any uh, membrane load, which will tend to increase the out of plane stiffness of the structure. So, the coupling between the out of plane and the in plane stiffness is accounted through a stress stiffness matrix. The typical example I could give you is um, a guitar string. As we, as we tighten the guitar string, it increases the uh, lateral stiffness, so it starts vibrating at different frequency and starts producing different tone of music. And another typical example is any cloth. As we stretch the cloth and apply the load, it deforms less and compared to keeping the cloth in a loosened state and applying the uh, structure. So this effect we call it as a stress stiffening effect. Uh, so you can activate this using stress stiff command, uh, command. Another one is the spin softening. So spin softening is to account the uh, no, uh, radial change that is happening in the geometry uh, when it is subjected to a uh, uh, rotary motion. So for example, let us assume this is a spring uh, with a mass at the tip, it is subjected to angular velocity. Because of the uh, centrifugal forces, it's being stretched by certain amount. There are two effects we need to account here, especially uh, when we talk about any structure which, which has large lateral load acting on it. Initially, the force into distance is the what the moment is being created on the structure. Because of the centrifugal force, if there is a stretch happening in the structure, the momentum is going to change and, um, and you know, the resulting load is different now. How we really account this in our calculation? We write uh, stiffness into force, uh, stiffness into displacement equal to force. Here, this is nothing but the centrifugal force. By rearranging the term, this particular thing, it is nothing but the initial stiffness of the structure. There is certain amount of uh, subtraction happening. What it means is the actual structure stiffness is reduced by certain amount. So we call that as a spin softening effect. The important point we need to consider here is, Whenever we activate a geometric nonlinear analysis in ANSYS, it is considering the change in geometry and based on the new nodal coordinates, it is going to compute the stiffness matrix. So whenever you activate geometric nonlinear analysis, there is no need to explicitly activate this effect. By default, it is taken care of. Probably there are certain situations wherein the deformations are still small, but you want to account for these two effects then we have to activate this effect using an explicit command. Let us look at hierarchy of the nonlinear problem, geometric nonlinear problems or the complexity involved in different nonlinear problems. The least one to handle is small deflection and small rotation problem. That is nothing but doing a very simple linear analysis. We assume the deflections are small and negligible. We don't want to consider that. The little more, the second complexity is the spin softening. The spin softening, we are just modifying the stiffness matrix, but still we are going to use the small deflection formulation and solve using that small deflection algorithm. The later one is the stress stiffening effect. Here it is done in an iterative fashion. In order to upon calculate the stress stiffness matrix, first we need to initially calculate what is the stress state in the structure. For that we need to do one iteration. In next iteration we will update the stiffness matrix, then we solve the problem. The third one is um, the large deflection and rotation problem wherein we have to separate the rigid body motion as well as the elastic deformation that are happening in the structure. The more complex one is nothing but the large strain problem, which by default accounts all lower version of the geometric nonlinearity. 
lot time formulation also include yeah any kind of material nonlinearity that are happening in the structure so whenever we solve material nonlinearity this by default includes the geometric nonlinearity it is taken care of in the geometric nonlinear formulation let us let us look at the uh, uh, stiffness matrix that is being used in uh, any uh, nonlinear problem. Generally, um, when we solve a linear problem, there is an initial stiffness matrix that is coming from the initial geometry, material property, and so on. But when we are going to a nonlinear problem, it is no more just the initial stiffness matrix that is going to govern our displacement. There are additional uh, effects which is adding up with the initial stiffness matrix. Something like this here, the in initial displacement rotation matrix, this is the one which is going to account for the reorientation of the structure. The update and model coordinates will be used here. Here is the one which is taking care of the stress defining effect. And the, the last one which will take care of the follower load effects due to the pressure loads or any load which follows the um, it, it reorients depending on the um, deformed shape of the structure. Well, let's move on to uh, really looking at how we are going to solve the nonlinear problem in ANSYS. If you want to solve any nonlinear problem, as we saw in first few slides, um, we have to solve this in an incremental way. We cannot um, solve that in a one state like f is equal to ku. We cannot just invert it. We have to solve using an incremental way. So let us assume a generic case, the element which undergoes a large strain, which means by default it can deform by large amount, it can rotate by large amount, it can undergo rod strain and so on. So when it goes to a different stage, we have to start recomputing the stiffness matrix at its every orientation. So we will solve that in an incremental way. Here is an example. Say I have a cantilever beam subjected to a 10 Newton load. If I am solving this in 10 number of substates, at every first it initially applies the 10 Newton load and it calculates the deformed position. Based on this deformed position, it recomputes the stiffness matrix. Then it applies additional 10 Newton of load and we are solving this in an incremental way. At every stage, based on its um, orientation and based on its test state, it will recompute the stiffness matrix. So how we are really accounting that? In finite element equation, we account that using our strain displacement matrix and writing the equilibrium equation. So we all know that the stiffness matrix uh, is computed using a, a product of uh, strain B matrix, C matrix and B transpose. Here is the one which relates the displacement and strain, we call that as a kinematic relation. So, when we formulate any element, we have to consider the appropriate kinematic relation for that element. Generally, how we can relate stress and strain? We know the resulting displacement is nothing but the shape function into the nodal displacement. The strain is nothing but the derivative of the displacement, that's nothing but the derivative of my safe function into nodal displacement. This term is called as B matrix, here is my displacement uh, vector. Let's move on to the constitutive relation. What does constitutive relation mean? In, it basically comes from the physics. It is to relate two physical um, quantities that exist in the material or any substance. That's what we call it as a, what is the relation between two physical quantities. In, in the field of structural mechanics, the constitutive relation means it relates applied stress or to the strain or displacement. The well-known um, constitutive relation or constitutive law that is known to everybody is the Hooke's law that relates stress and strain through a constant called Young's Molnar. But however, when we are moving on to a nonlinear analysis or different dimension of the geometry, depending on the dimensions and problem, di problem dimensionality and the material model what we use, the D matrix is going to change. For example, these are all the uh, D matrix used in a 3D Hooke's law or for any linear thing. If you start using a hyperelastic material, the constitutive relation is um, completely different. It is written in terms of the strain energy potential rather using the stress-strain relation. 
So, how we finally account the stress strain relations and the constitutive equation in our stiffness matrix? Uh, we know the relation between stress and strain through the constitutive law, and also we know the relation between the displacement and strain through the B matrix. So, finally, I can relate my stress with respect to the material and with respect to the displacement that is happening. So, if I start writing my final nonlinear equilibrium equation, the K into displacement, the K becomes a product of all these multiplied by the U matrix. When I do iterative, after every iteration, I will update my, uh, we have to update the stress state based on the deflection that exists and we go on. So, in order to predict a real nonlinear behavior of the structure, we need to make sure the element that we choose from the ANSYS library uses, uh, use, formulated using the appropriate kinematic relations and using appropriate uh, constitutive relations, especially if you are going to a material nonlinear range. Let us look at the solution scheme, how we are going to capture a nonlinear response of the structure. Uh, for solving any nonlinear problem, uh, we are not going to solve a different nonlinear equation. We are still going to solve the same equation that is nothing but product of uh, my stiffness and the displacement matrix equal to F. But how we solve is we will try to approximate the nonlinear response of the structure using a incremental linear solution. So we are not actually solving for a this nonlinear curve. We still solve using a linear uh, linear solution and we try to approximate that. So we ANSYS typically uses a Newton Raphson algorithm to solve any nonlinear response um, using a incremental linear approach wherein we apply the load in an incremental way. Every load increment uh, is a linear increment. Then we are trying to equate the external force and the internal force uh, for uh, any equilibrium condition, the difference between the external force and the internal force should be minimum or it should be a zero. So we will keep doing this iteration until the difference between the external force and internal force becomes zero or negligible. Uh, here is a typical example. Uh, say I want to apply a 100 Newton load here. I want to solve the nonlinear response of the structure. Uh, let us assume this is uh, solved using sub two sub-steps. The first sub-step it will apply a 50 Newton load and second sub-step it will apply a 100 Newton load. Between every sub-step it is going to do a number of iterations until it converges. Here is, here, here is how it goes. First it will use the initial stiffness matrix and calculate what is the displacement. For this particular displacement it calculates what is the internal force that exists in the structure. So, for example, under this particular point, okay, this much is the internal force and this much is my applied force, here is the residual, which means that this is the unbalanced, so the structure is not in the equilibrium. Next time, the stiffness matrix is just updated and, we'll, and one more iteration is done. At the end of this iteration, we will compare what is the internal force and what is the external force and we will try to calculate the residual. We will be keep doing this iteration. After every iteration, we update the stiffness matrix till the difference between the external force and the internal force becomes zero. Okay, that that is nothing but my um, that is nothing but the equilibrium condition. Here is the thing: when we are doing the iteration, it is certainly not possible to make exactly the difference between internal and external forces zero we will give a small tolerance okay um, the the difference between the external force and internal force within this limit we can say okay my problem is converged it's under equilibrium and i can move on to the next um, next load increment so uh, okay here is how we calculate uh, this tolerance this tolerance is calculated as a percentage of your applied force. For example, here the residual is, uh, say for, uh, for a displacement, if it is less than 0 0.05 percentage of the applied force, then we say, okay, this, uh, this particular load step is converged, we will move on to the second iteration. And we keep moving on with, uh, with respect to the load step. So what, this is what we call it as a criterion. 
so now we say how we are expecting uh, accepting the con the iteration is converged or we are saying this is equilibrium this is the one parameter if i say the the tolerance is something like one percentage of the applied load it is easy to converge but the out of balance is very really large typically when we see a problem like this what we are seeing at the back row is the purple color line shows what is the residual after every iteration and this criterion line shows what is the acceptable limit when after every iteration if the residual becomes less than the criteria or the acceptable tolerance we say the iteration is converged and we will move on to the next load step that's what we typically see in our uh, output window or graphical uh, tracking solution so um, here are a couple of um, uh, tips to uh, deal with the convergence criteria most of the time the default convergence criteria works you don't want to um, Uh, play with the default convergence criteria for tolerance setting but whenever we have a tough situation we can slightly uh, relax the tolerance and try to achieve the convergence um, faster but we need to be aware that we are slightly deviating from the equilibrium condition of the structure so in workbench under analysis setting here is the place you can go and change the tolerance and uh, reference value there are some situations wherein we want to really tighten the tolerance um, when we tighten the tolerance probably it may take couple of more iteration but we are more close to the actual equilibrium condition let's look at a couple of uh, machine consideration um, uh, we we have seen that it is really important to use appropriate kinematic and constitutive relations to capture the nonlinear response of the structure um uh, in non this not all elements uh, supports geometric nonlinearity for example uh, pretension elements or contact 52 or not really supporting the uh, geometric nonlinear effect uh, there are some other elements like shell 63 which um, support uh, large displacement but which will not support the large strain problem uh, so you need to really look into the element help manual to understand the that that particular element supports the um, all kind of geometric nonlinearities or not this problem mostly exist with the legacy elements when we when we move towards the current generation elements all elements are formulated uh, from the scratch um, assuming that we are going to do a nonlinear analysis so workbench takes care of it automatically when you when you mesh using a workbench a uh, workbench is having certain inbuilt smartness so that it understand uh, whether i need to pick a element which supports a lot strain problems or not um, when we do a, a lot strain problem the mesh is expected to distort too much so we need to take care in um, creating the mesh with uh, acceptable quality of the element as as the solution progresses your element shapes get distorted so probably you may consider rejoining as the feature to bring back element quality to a acceptable limit um here is a typical situation of um, uh, no misconsideration uh, when this uh, structure is subjected to a, a large strain problem this element deformation makes the internal angle to be a large okay so which is not acceptable uh, quality criteria so probably if you anticipate this kind of a deformation behavior instead of making one quad element split that into a, a two triangular element still you maintain all your element quality criteria acceptable even after a large deformation so this kind of consideration need to be taken care while creating the initial mesh especially we are planning for a, a large strain problem and output um, interpretation um, after doing a nonlinear analysis on this report true stress and true strain it is not the engineering stress and engineering strain most of the time um, if you have a material its ultimate or uh, ultimate stress is defined in in engineering measure rather in true uh, stress strain measure so we have to take a stress strain curve of the material and convert it into a true stress strain curve then we need to start comparing it and another important thing we need to keep in mind is especially when you are looking at the results in uh, element coordinate system uh, the element coordinate system rotates along with the geometry so 
for example a large deformation rolling of a rod into a circular arch the results are reported in the element coordinate system uh, not in the original coordinate system but however the nodal displacement nodal coordinate systems are noted still you can interpret the displacement in the global cartesian coordinate system um, the other learning resources all this uh, self manual is the uh, first friend to learn uh, anything about ansys there is a dedicated chapter about um, geometric nonlinearity uh, start discussing about different kind of formulation that we have discussed in depth in, and in detail we may start referring that okay uh, the other one is there is a question most of the time uh, i don't know when really uh, do i need to activate the geometric uh, nonlinear analysis or not Um, here are the couple of guidelines, but uh, no, this is not a, a hard and solid rule holds uh, applicable under all situations. These are all certain initial guidelines. When you are talking about when we are dealing with any plate-like structures, uh, if the lateral deformation is more than half of the thickness, then this is a typical indication that yes, I have to activate my geometric nonlinear calculation. um when we are solving a beam element uh, because of the load if we expect um, the momentum to change or the force direction to change those places we need to apply the geometric nonlinear calculation uh, in solids most of the time solids uh, will not undergo a, any bulky structures will not really undergo a large deformation um, there are certain exception like rubber kind of a material or plastics from the beginning it start exhibiting a, a large strain or even a large uh, metal component uh, when it goes beyond the plastic limit uh, it start exhibiting a large strain behavior and kind of application um, things we need to account okay so in any situation if you are not sure whether there is a, a, a geometric nonlinearity exists or not in your analysis it is always good to um, account um, no activate the geometric nonlinear calculation though it is going to take more time your results are more accurate okay and um, so for example you have solved a problem wherein you have not considered the uh, geometric nonlinearity but how do i decide okay so after solving a problem look at your strain ranges if the strain range is very small say something around 1 to 2 percentage um uh, you can say okay the 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 uh, no the um, the difference of not considering the geometric nonlinear effect is uh, very small and negligible but however when you see the strain is more than 5 percentage or um, 3 percentage probably you know um, uh, it's it's a hint that yes you have to account you have to think about activating the geometric nonlinear effect in your calculation by the way having discussed all these things um uh, no uh, let us see where to activate this uh, geometric nonlinear effect so all this doesn't know whether the problem is really linear problem or nonlinear problem it's a user's responsibility to instruct the ansys you account geometric nonlinear effects and do the calculation okay um, in in mechanical apdl under solution controls you can instruct the ansys okay do a large displacement problem it means that it is going to um, recompute the stiffness matrix after every um, deformation and do the thing in workbench under analysis setting here is the option you say large deflection on which means that ansys understands um, no i have to update my stiffness matrix and start doing a um, geometric nonlinear analysis okay um, in summary um, geometric nonlinear analysis is nothing but uh, we need to account the deformations happening in the structure due to the applied load and solve the problem in incremental manner when we boiling this down into a mathematical terminology or finite element um, finite element term all we are doing is after every load increment we are updating the stiffness matrix and based on the updated stiffness matrix we are computing the response of the structure the nonlinear analysis can be activated using a geometric uh, nlgeom uh, on command and all nonlinear problems are solved uh, using a newton raphson technique but however ansys has additional nonlinear solvers like uh, arclent method and so on um, probably um, uh, in future we will be 
talking about um, buckling and non-linear, there is a, a present day a webinar planned for uh, buckling analysis where we will be touching upon uh, what what is the difference between uh, Newton Raphson algorithm and arc length algorithm, when to use arc length method and so on. So in order to get a realistic response for any uh, non-linear system, it is really important to choose right kinematics, right constitutive relation uh, element, and right mesh, right solution control to overcome all these convergence difficulties that we commonly come across.
it seems that uh, we had some errors errors in our uh, web app station. So the new new box appeared and a new number said in. Yes, I think this connection is gone. Yeah, let's see if uh, we can uh, revert back to the event. Let's let's see. Uh, we are trying to. Probably we'll be able to. I'm changing the role. Santosh, can you now uh, bring up your slides once again? Yeah. Uh, yeah, my, my, my screen is completely hanged. Uh, I could not do anything on my web screen. Yeah, we we'll wait for a couple of minutes. Uh, don't say end program at any point of time. It's regaining the connection. So I okay. thought that's also not to end right now. It's it had some uh, web issue. So uh, we'll wait and uh, see if we can regain the connection. Uh, same thing happened at our end here, and uh, we seem to have regained it. I never see this color.
go back so that now it has come out of that event. And it will so it has to be installed again perhaps. The program has to be you know, let them test. Uh, there was some technical issue for which we were not able to connect. Uh, now I am hoping that you are able to see the slides and uh, yes. probably we can uh, start now. Santosh, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Can all of you see the slide? Yep. Yes. Okay, we are sorry about this interruption. Um, let's continue where we stopped. Um, we have discussed about, um, you know, uh, for any practical problems, uh, if we are not accounting the geometric nonlinear non-linearity, how our results are going to be different? Um, let us 